Glad to be back at Dynamic Walking after a too long of a hiatus. I'll be talking today about studies uh, in human balance control. A typical control diagram that we often see in a textbook looks something like this, where body motions are sensed by body sensors to inform the central nervous system about um, how to provide corrective torques to stabilize motion. And we might simplify that as a little uh, pie chart down here where we have to fill that pie chart to be stable, and then we can break it up to the contributions of vision, vestibular, and proprioception. However, this may not be the only story, because if some of the uh, dynamics of the motion are passively stable, meaning that the motions themselves create corrective feedback torques, right, then we would have to update our diagram to look something like this, where balance is achieved through some combination of active and passive uh, feedback. So what is the evidence for this? Well, 3D Passive dynamic walkers are stable in the AP direction and unstable in the medial lateral direction. So our pie charts might look something like this, where in the medial lateral direction we have to achieve stability through entirely active feedback control, and in the AP direction it would be some combination of passive stability and feedback control. What do I mean by active and passive feedback? Those aren't the best names. I wish I had better names. By active, I mean high-level integrative sensory feedback. By uh, uh, Passive stability could be inferred, so passive stability does not necessarily mean no neuromuscular activation. It just means that you need to do enough low-level, uh, almost feed-forward neuromuscular activation to create a nominal walking cycle, and then from there, the limb physics provide a passive stability benefit. Okay. So we wanted to test this 10 years ago, Art and I. Uh, we thought, let's put a person on a treadmill in a virtual reality environment, and then we can per perturb the environment in different directions. Right? And the thought was, OK, if they are heavily reliant on active feedback in the medial lateral direction, that if we provide medial lateral visual perturbations, we should see lots of adjustments in step width. And if we perturb them in the AP direction, if they can rely on passive stability, they may be less sensitive to the AP perturbations and adjust step length less. So this is what we found. On the upper left, we have medial lateral perturbation amplitude versus step width variability. We saw significant trend. So as you increase perturbation amplitude, they adjusted their step width variability significantly. Um, in the AP direction, as we increased AP perturbation amplitude, they actually they didn't change their step length variability. So they actually were not sensitive at all to the AP perturbations, or you could say they rejected them. Okay. And I want to educate you on our, our main outcome metric from, from data like this, is that we want to look at the slope of these perturbation amplitude versus step placement variability trends where the slope is indicating a sensitivity to the visual perturbation. So you could think of it as like a control game. Okay, and so we can plot it something like this, where um, as you'd expect from the data on the left, we have a high medial lateral sensitivity and a low, in fact, not significant AP sensitivity. Okay. But this left some nagging questions. One is, um, how are they not falling off the treadmill? If they only relied on virtual visual information, they would drift off the treadmill. In fact, that's what would happen early stages of training, I would shut the lights off and then run behind them so they didn't drift off the treadmill. But eventually they learned to moderate their speed. Well, they must have been picking up on some non-virtual peripheral information to control their speed. And is that washing out um, the AP perturbations? Another question is, maybe our perturbations just aren't big enough. If we hit them with larger perturbations, we would see some AP effect. And then the other question is, is this relevant, or how does this change in older adults? Okay, so I have three goals here. One is we wanted to eliminate non-virtual information, make sure they can't cheat. And then if we do that through a head-mounted display, we thought we would still see greater sensitivity to um, frontal plane, now um, perturbations versus sagittal plane. We also thought if we could try larger amplitudes and more stimulating perturbations, that would be good. By more stimulating, we're going to actually also try rotational or pendular-like perturbations. We thought that would be more stimulating for two reasons. One, visually, as you'll see in some videos, it just looks more visually stimulating. And second, while if walking is a pendular-like task, maybe pendular-like perturbations are, are more um, picked up by the subjects. And then finally, what changes in the older adults? And I left the hypothesis blank because I could convince myself too many different ways of how it might change. OK, so we had subjects walking on an um, instrumented treadmill, um, wearing a head-mounted display. It was an Oculus Rift. We were very careful to block out any kind of light that might come in from the periphery. So we had a lot of sponge put in around the nose. Um, subjects took about 10 minutes to train and get comfortable um, in the environment. And then we were ready to start hitting with these 
individual perturbations. So every perturbation trial, we measure the variability in step width and step length over at least 300 steps. So what are the per uh, constant speed? So the question is, how do we get them to walk on the at constant speed? And I'll show you that in a second. Um, in terms of the perturbations, we can break them up into two classifications. One is the type or modality, so either a pendular or a linear. Okay? And then from there, we can also break it up into the sagittal plane and the frontal plane. So that gave us four types of perturbations, um, a pitch, a roll, a um, AP, and a ML. So we had four types of perturbations, and then four amplitudes of perturbation for each perturbation type. So what do these perturbations look like? This is a medial-lateral perturbation. So you see, this, you see this drift from side to side. You can also get a sense for what the environment looked like. Subjects could look around and even look into the neighboring rooms. AP perturbation really shows up as a kind of speeding up and slowing down effect. Yes. So it's, it's a sum of three sinusoids, so it's smooth, but it appears random to the subject. Yeah. This is all, they, they all have the same nature in that they're, they're, the perturbations are three sinusoids added on top of each other, and then just dip in different directions. So you can see that the roll, what the roll looks like, you can see pitch. You can see why I thought these pendular-like perturbations would be more visually stimulating. It seems like we're really hitting them pretty hard with these, these pendular perturbations. And, um, uh, but they they could they could handle it. Um, we have a large treadmill, and um, and then with the with the uh, pairing the, the pendular versus the linear perturbations, we tried to match the amplitude. So, for example, the biggest perturb and what you saw here is the biggest perturbations that the subjects would be exposed to. So, biggest would be like in pitch would be a plus or minus thirty percent pitch, okay. And then the, and that however far that moved in the anterior posterior direction, that's what the largest anterior posterior perturbation was given. Okay. How did they adjust their speed. Well, we gave them visual cues. So if they were too far back on the treadmill because they were going slow, the hallway turned green. As they moved more towards the center, the hallway was black. And then if they were still too fast and they drifted to the front, the hallway was turning red. Subjects got really good at picking up, staying in the center and picking up on very subtle uh, light red-green uh, red cues. Okay. You don't need to. They also had white, played white noise to them, so they couldn't pick up anything ex uh, external. But you can see now that the subject's reaction to a roll perturbation, we're seeing a lot of step width adjustments. Always had a spotter. Yes, yeah, five foot by seven foot treadmill, so we um, were able to hit, we hit them with twice as large perturbations as we ever had because we had more room. I was just as nervous, though, because uh, <laughs> We got them to go still to the extremes. You can see that in that last perturbation with the pitch, you probably didn't visually see much change. So that kind of tells you the story of what we found. But here's what the data looks like. Um, in the, comparing the frontal plane versus the sagittal plane, subjects were 9.3 times more sensitive, sensitive to the frontal plane perturbations versus sagittal. So that's what we expected. We didn't find an effect on the type of perturbation, linear versus pendular, which I was surprised at. Um, so I'm not exactly sure why. But statistically, that's why, because the, the roll was less than, than the medial lateral and the frontal plane, but then the pitch was a little bit higher than the AP and sagittal. So overall, we still think this idea that in the frontal plane, active control is dominant, and in the sagittal plane, uh, passive stability appears to be very, very, very significant. Okay. How does this change with older adults? Well, we tested nine younger and older adults, um, and uh, let's... I have the data here for the medial lateral sensitivity. Um, so what we found is no change. These are actually healthy older adults that have been screened for medical conditions. They, they walk regularly, no, have no history of falls. No difference in medial lateral sensitivity. But when we look at AP sensitivity, they, their older adults are significantly more sensitive to these AP perturbations than young. Okay? And in fact, if we just look at older between medial lateral and AP, they're equally sensitive in both directions. Okay. So I thought it was very interesting, this general idea that older adults compared to the young cannot reject these AP perturbations. Okay, so this is the qu question is why? Okay. So on the spectrum from uh, healthy balance to having a functional balance problem, 
We think our older adults were somewhere in the middle, we might call preclinical, where they didn't have a functional balance problem, but there were adaptations that have happened with age that changed the way they balance, okay? And so I have two hypotheses about why they might be more sensitive to AP, AP perturbations, but I believe one of them is more important. So the one in the upper right is this idea that, okay, between the young and the older, there's no change in passive stability, okay? But due to degradation in vestibular proprioceptive, they're just generally more visually sensitive, okay? Problem with this, that would apply to any kind of visual perturbation we did, so they would just generally be using visual information more, and we did not see that. In the medial lateral direction, there was no difference between young and old. Also, we tested them standing, I don't have that data, no difference in sensitivity to the visual perturbation. So I don't think it's just a general over-reliance on vision in this subject group. Another hypothesis would be that these older adults don't make use of passive dynamics, passive stability to the same degree, and so they need to fill that gap with active control, and that makes them in a, the AP direction for walking uh, more uh, sensitive to these visual perturbations. So future research can be looking at um, combining visual, physical perturbations, other measures to kind of tease out, are they losing some passive stability? Is this a good preclinical metric for changes in balance with age? Okay, so thank you. This is a, this is, most of this work was done by a team of four uh, undergrads. I call them Wondergrads. Um, they, they, together, they did most of the, the testing. So they did a great job, so I want to thank them. Thank you. So if, if we're looking at the AP direction, if, if we hit you with AP perturbations and increase the amplitude of those perturbations, how much do you increase your step length variability? So it's kind of like a garbage in, garbage out approach. Bigger noise in, you get bigger, more variability in step length, and then that slope of that relationship is your sensitivity. And then the same thing for the medial lateral. Right. So is, um, is there, how do, you, how do you normalize the amplitude Well, um, we, we just, uh, we're going on the subject, pitch and roll, we can do the same degree amplitude, right. and so they, they, they're, it's, good, it's a close enough comparison. Right, and then, and then the medial lateral stability versus anterior posterior, um, sorry, I keep saying stability, um, sensitivity, um, so you're measuring the variance in, in step length in the forward out direction versus side to side. Yes. Um, is there, do you need to account for the fact that like the normal step length will be much larger than the side to side step length? Is, uh, is there something there? Um, not necessarily because we think the controllability of, 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 of you know the, the the difference in step length, right? That there we have to get a deep, equally in some region you have you know no reason to think that there's it's harder to do increase step length or shorten it versus wide, right? So around the controllability region. Um, it's equally, you're equally capable of, of you know, increasing step length by 0.1 meters or widening it by 0.1 meters. Um, uh, Kate? Um, uh, can you explain to me again, uh, sort of as a follow up to that question, how you chose the sizes of the perturbations? Um, basically, as, uh, well, we, wanted, we doubled what we've done before, and then they were in the, um, for the roll perturbations. Uh, and the medial lateral perturbations, they were basically as big as we could produce without them falling off the side of the treadmill. So that, that was our limit. We had a 10 foot wide treadmill, we might have needed some bigger perturbations, but we were, we were capped out of, on the treadmill width. I guess the only reason I ask is that the way you thought about measuring the difference in the actual like uh, size of the visual signals that would be falling off the retina. Forgive me for using that all words. Um, because because there's a pretty big difference in the actual amount of like, <coughs> even though they're pretty equivalent in like body centric right. coordinates, um, even the difference between your roll and your pitch is going to be different. Um, no, that's, that's, that's a great point. Um, uh, so pre previously, what we've, we've relied on the fact that we uh, were able to do things like have a person doing normal standing and perturb them. Uh, in both directions, 
and show that in standing, now you're more sensitive to the AP direction versus the ML. So we can at least show that as a task dynamics change, the relative weighting is changing, and so at least there's some parity between the directions of the visual perturbations, but um, are they one-to-one? -one? Probably not, and we need to look at those types of metrics to figure that out. No, no, it's quick. So I, I have an alternative hypothesis for why the uh, four off direction has smaller step. I have an alternative hypothesis for why the um, ML direction has a smaller um, step length uh, change. So if I just look at an inverted pendulum and say that the subject perceives the visual perturbation as a perturbation of the velocity of its center of mass, then to go back to the nominal trajectory, uh, my angle is already big in the four up direction, but it's zero in the medial lateral direction. So to get the same um, impulse in the four up direction, I need to only increase my step length a little bit, <coughs> and this would change the horizontal impulse more than in the medial lateral direction, right? So there might be just a mechanical reason for why this happens. Right. Well, that, so if we were looking at um, like a relative difference, maybe the AP was, or ML was, uh, you know, 1.3 times more sensitive than the AP, then we, we might have to think about those things. But when we show basically very, very, very low AP sensitivity versus very high ML sensitivity, it, it, it's kind of speaking more towards that. I, I think that's, that's less likely. 